Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is David Barr. I'm the Head of Innovation at the Society of Chemical Industry, and it's my great uh, uh, pleasure to, to be chairing this meeting this afternoon. Uh, so if you're, uh, yeah, that's brilliant timing. So the, there will be a question and answer session at the end of this. Um, if we're not having live questions and answers. If you have a question, please put it in the questions box at any time and we'll sort them out and answer them and such. You're all in listen mode only um, because we found that's the best way to, to organize these sorts of meetings. Uh, so as I say, welcome to this afternoon. So our speaker uh, this afternoon is Tristan Kay, um, who's the commercial director of NOPLA, and he'll explain what that means and what it also means, as they say. Uh, Tristan's uh, come across, as it were, from the dark side of the oil and gas industry, uh, and he has, has committed himself, uh, along with the rest of the NOPLA team, to producing much more sustainable products from a very, very sustainable source. Uh, I was lucky enough to see him and one of his colleagues talking earlier in the month and actually tasting the product as they are. So it's a real shame that this one's not in person because you would truly enjoy it. I can guarantee that. Uh, but uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Tristan and ask him to give his talk about the Nopla products. Thanks, David. Uh, and it's wonderful to be here virtually with, uh, with everyone this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to, there's always a, a little moment of apprehension when uh, even after several years of, uh, of doing these things, of sharing the screen and seeing that the technology uh, is working. So I'm just... It works. The, everyone can see it. Fantastic. Okay. Um, yeah. So thank you for having me this afternoon. It's, uh, it's lovely to be here to be able to talk about what we are doing at, uh, at Nopla. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the origins of the name uh, as we go through the presentation this afternoon. Uh, fundamentally, really, what uh, what we're doing is uh, we're creating, as uh, as you mentioned, David, creating a whole range of different uh, packaging materials. And uh, for those who are on the call this afternoon, uh, particularly with the answer, the, the question and answers a little bit later on, uh, I'll do my very best to answer all of the questions that might come through. Uh, I am not a chemist, I'm not a biologist, uh, but uh, the really unique thing about what we do at Nopla is that we are a collection of individuals who come from a very diverse uh, set of backgrounds. And actually, we think that's one of our core strengths because it means that we're able to look at problems from uh, from multiple perspectives. Uh, and um, and we think that that means that we come up with, uh, you know, there's the... Um, the, the, the increased likelihood that we come up with different solutions uh, and uh, because we look at those uh, at those problems with a different set of uh, background, we see things that maybe some other people don't necessarily see. We were very fortunate last year to win Prince William's Earthshot Prize. Uh, and this is the prize that was established by the Prince. Uh, this was the second uh, awarding. Uh, it's in its third year now uh, established by the prince as an environmental prize uh, to help acknowledge uh, to reward and, and to support importantly to support individuals uh, organizations businesses that are focused on tackling some of humanity's biggest environmental challenges uh, we won for in the in the category of building a waste-free world uh, and uh, here is the, the, some of the footage of, uh, of the evening. So we were actually uh, on the balcony of an apartment that had been rented by the BBC for the evening, specifically for, uh, for the filming of the event. Uh, David Beckham and uh, the Prince were in Boston. They were in Boston, by the way, because that's where John F. Kennedy made the original uh, speech around uh, the aspiration of, of putting... Uh, humankind on the moon within a short period of time back in the 60s and, and uh, uh, believing that for focusing uh, brilliant minds on a really challenging problem, we can come up with uh, with incredible outcomes. So when this is a genuine reaction by us, uh, by the way, we were truly, uh, truly surprised when the acknowledgement came through. We were live uh, and uh, the BBC said to us afterwards, uh, how did you not know? I mean, you not look around, you see all these uh, film uh, film crew and uh, and this location. We said, well, we thought that you were doing this for for everybody who is a finalist. Uh, to which they replied, the BBC doesn't have that big a budget. Um, so 
uh, it's been a, a tremendous journey since uh, that announcement, which is now about six or seven months ago. Uh, and it, the reason why we were awarded that prize uh, is because of the work that we're doing really around ta tackling plastic and, and particularly plastic in, in the packaging space. And uh, I'm sure everybody here on the call this afternoon has seen uh, a range of different numbers around just how significant this, uh, this challenge is that we face uh, as a global community. Certainly when I worked in oil and gas and uh, spending a lot of time in uh, areas in Southeast Asia extracting oil and gas uh, and noticing, it was impossible not to notice, the sheer density of plastic waste that was on the beaches uh, in otherwise pristine environments. And a lot of that wasn't necessarily coming from, uh, from those countries. Although, as you can see here on the left-hand side, particularly in non-OECD number, uh, non-OECD countries, there is quite a lot of plastic waste uh, that is mismanaged, that is, is open dumped uh, or, or uncollected. But fundamentally, uh, a lot of this is finding its way into our natural environment. We think purely about uh, a European scenario. Uh, the other interesting thing to bear in mind here is that potentially the problem is even bigger than uh, the numbers necessarily suggest because of firstly the challenge in collecting all the data uh, and uh, when looking at those numbers in aggregate there are lots and lots of gaps so uh, I guess uh, we, we see a lot of a uh, lot of emphasis that is emphasis that is put on to recycling as an end of life option for um, you know for, for all materials but but particularly for plastics. And uh, some of you may have seen this study that was just released uh, very, very recently. It was focused exclusively on the UK. In fact, it was on a plastics recycling facility. And it was looking at um, the amount of microplastics that were escaping that recycling facility through uh, essentially the washing uh, processes, even with screens in place in, uh, in that discharge water. So. Uh, we don't believe at Notpla, we don't believe that uh, recycling is, is the holy grail, that sometimes it is being held up to be. In fact, we need uh, a set of multifaceted solutions. Uh, recycling is not the sole solution. And, and uh, I know that um, there are uh, increasing, the, you know, there's increasing effort that is being put into looking at things like chemical recycling. Um, but certainly when it comes to mechanical recycling, uh, there are lots and lots of challenges uh, around that. And so really uh, what we are seeing, and, and again, I'm sure uh, everybody on the call has seen various forms of, uh, of these sorts of uh, statements, but it is undeniable that we have uh, microplastics in our body. Of course, we don't know what the long-term impacts of that are going to be, but we can't debate the fact that uh, microplastics are incredibly prevalent and they're being found in, uh, uh, in the human body and, in fact, even in, uh, in unborn uh, babies. So it is certainly something that we are really heavily focused on trying to develop uh, solutions for, and, and this fundamentally goes to what it is that we do. We are challenging the conventions around packaging and uh, we are inspired by this idea of making packaging disappear. Certainly packaging is as we recognize it today. And, uh, and David alluded to, uh, to one element of that in that uh, one of our products is actually designed to, um, to be eaten. But we look to nature. Uh, nature really is the inspiration for everything that we do. And, uh, the most obvious example of that, of course, is a fruit peel. Uh, so nature has developed a, a pretty remarkable way over a very long period of time to transport things uh, to us in the form of uh, fruits. And uh, the peel, you may choose to eat the peel. You probably don't choose to eat the banana peel. But, uh, you know, in the case of a tomato or in the case of an apple or a grape, you will uh, most likely eat the peel. Uh, if you're my son, you won't, but, uh, but most of us will, uh, will eat the peel. If you don't, then nature is able to deal with that peel uh, pretty quickly uh, and uh, return it back into uh, the natural environment where uh, it leaves no, uh, leaves no lasting harm. Uh, and so what, um, what we do is that uh, we are, uh, of course, deeply guided by the European Union's single-use plastic directive and the definition 
uh, within that of the material needing to be both a natural polymer uh, and also for it not to be chemically modified. And uh, this is particularly interesting for, um, uh, for things like bioplastics and in the case uh, here, right back to the, the reference in our name. So we say Nopla as in the contraction of the two words, not plastic, but also there's a play there on PLA. So we are not PLA either. Uh, and you can see down in the bottom left-hand quadrant that uh, uh, PLA, for, for anyone on the call who's, uh, who's not aware, PLA polylactic acid, which is usually derived from, uh, from corn. Uh, it's a bioplastic. It, it is compostable, but it's industrially compostable. Uh, so it needs to be dealt with in a very specific way. And that industrial composting network doesn't really uh, exist at scale, certainly in, uh, in the UK and, and in a lot of European Union markets. Uh, so uh, things like PLA, and if, um, if you had a, a takeaway coffee today, uh, there's probably a good chance you will have seen a claim on that coffee cup that said things like compostable or maybe it said biodegradable. Uh, if you looked closely, you might have seen somewhere where it would refer to industrially compostable, but still there are a lot of these sorts of um, PLA coated uh, packaging items in the market that just claim compostable because uh, a consumer typically thinks that comp uh, compostable equals good. And uh, the reality is, and, and this is what the EU SUPD is now uh, is now capturing, is that unless PLA is dealt with in a very specific way, uh, then really it's not that different to a, um, a fossil-based plastic in terms of what happens if it finds its way into the natural environment. Uh, so we are using seaweed uh, as really the core of, uh, of all of the material development that we are doing. And seaweed is, is a, a really interesting material. By the way, it's not a plant. Uh, it doesn't belong to the plant kingdom. It belongs to the protista uh, kingdom. The reason why it's not a, classified as a, as a plant is because it doesn't have all of the, um, the attributes of a plant. It doesn't have a vascular system. Uh, it doesn't have roots. It doesn't have uh, leaves. I mean, even though you see here on the screen or or some of the big strappy seaweed that uh, you might be familiar with on uh, washing up on beaches, etc. They look like leaves. That they're, they're not. Uh, they're not classified as leaves. They belong to a different uh, kingdom. Of course, they grow uh, in salt water. And there's two broad uh, categories, if you like, macro and micro. Micro being the really small, uh, macro being the larger stuff that you are uh, familiar with on on jetties, on rocks, on uh, on beaches, etc. Uh, so, you know, it's growing in uh, predominantly in salt water or brackish water. Uh, it doesn't require land, uh, of course, to, uh, to grow, and therefore it's not competing with, with any food crops. Uh, and uh, like a plant, though, uh, it photosynthesizes. Uh, so it requires carbon dioxide and it requires sunlight in order to grow, and uh, it respires oxygen. So uh, some estimates are that even up to half of the oxygen that's in our atmosphere that we are, are breathing on a daily basis is actually being respired by seaweed uh, of uh, varying types. Not, uh, it's not coming from forestry uh, or half of it's not coming from, uh, from land-based um, plants. So it is a, it's a really interesting uh, material uh, and it has a lot of natural polymer-like properties. So we're interested in, in it from that point of view, but we're also deeply interested in it from uh, the environmental and, uh, and sustainability point of view uh, as well. So one of the things that we get asked uh, a lot is around where does seaweed come from? Uh, where does it grow? Uh, is it sustainable to, uh, to be taking seaweed out of the, the natural environment? And, and they're all... Um, really, uh, really valid questions. And they're all the sorts of things that we are thinking about on, uh, on a daily basis. So uh, around about 70% of the planet is uh, covered with oceans. Uh, but for every one acre of ocean that we as humanity, that we, we cultivate in some form, uh, be that through aquaculture, be that through uh, seaweed farming, etc. For every one acre of the ocean that we cultivate, we are cultivating 250,000 acres of land. 
but over two thirds of the planet is uh, is covered in oceans. So uh, there is a huge potential to use our oceans more than we do now. And uh, the um, some of the work that we've been doing with with organisations like uh, Seaweed for Europe, etc., uh, have been doing quite a lot of uh, deep analysis on how much of the ocean could be available to actually cultivate uh, seaweed. And, and the current estimates are around about 1% of the ocean's uh, surface area. Uh, so adjacent, you can see some of the, the lines here around landmass, uh, around 1% of the ocean's surface area uh, is, is cultivatable uh, without having uh, any impact on uh, on, you know, on surrounding ecosystems and so on. And, and um, seaweed is, uh, when, it's, uh, when it's farmed, uh, is typically offshore. Uh, so there's quite a bit that is happening uh, now, particularly in the, uh, in the North Sea, uh, particularly attached to things like offshore wind, uh, wind farms. Um, but uh, it also lends itself very well to being done in conjunction with, uh, with fish farming and so on because of its ability to, um, to clean the water. But a, a little uh, theoretical exercise that uh, that we did is uh, so taking that uh, one percent of the uh, the ocean surface area, which by the way is about for one percent is about four million square kilometers. Uh, I'm originally from Australia, uh, and Australia's uh, landmass is just under eight million square kilometers. So just over, you know, to, to give you a sense of scale, just over half of Australia's landmass is about 1% of uh, the world's oceans. Um, two thirds of all of that, if we were to theoretically, if we could theoretically replace all of the single use plastic, we would only need two thirds of that space. So there's a huge um, uh, amount of potential to increase the amount of uh, seaweed cultivation globally. By the way, uh, many of you on the call uh, this afternoon will have interacted, used, uh, consumed even, seaweed today without necessarily being aware of it. Uh, it is used uh, or, or extracts from seaweed are used extensively in food and beverage, uh, in cosmetics, uh, in, in wound care, in, in, in uh, pharmaceutical applications. So it really is a, uh, a global industry. Uh, what we are doing at Knoppler, of course, is uh, taking that into packaging. And, and there are many, many more startups now who are doing similar sorts of things. Uh, but there's also quite a lot of interest in uh, in seaweed for the carbon sequestration uh, that I was talking about before. The fact that uh, seaweed is is sequestering needs CO2 in order to grow. Um, a lot of CO2, by the way, which is emitted uh, by uh, by human activity, uh, is actually dissolved in our oceans. It's not necessarily circulating in the atmosphere. So what that does is it, it leads to increased acidification of, of the oceans and uh, CO2 will absorb that dissolved CO2. Uh, and then it can it can potentially lock that CO2 up if it uh, is uh, is dropped to uh, depths of, uh, of the ocean. There's quite a lot of interesting research that's happening in this space related to the sargassum uh, outblooms that, that uh, typically occur around uh, South America related to uh, intense uh, nutrient runoff from agriculture uh, and sargassum, which is a floating seaweed. Um, really proliferates on uh, on that nutrient so research is looking at uh at taking that those sargassum outbreaks and dropping it down to around about a thousand uh, meters it seems and then it's able to to lock that co2 up uh, at the bottom of the ocean you know just like uh happened many uh tens and hundreds of millions of years ago this uh ocean economy is um uh, as the, the UN calls it, by the way, around about 3 billion people globally have their livelihoods that depend upon the ocean in some form, whether that be through tourism, whether that be through fishing, whether that be through shipping. Uh, so, you know, almost half of the world's uh, global, or the world's population relies upon the ocean uh, for, uh, for its livelihood. And on the right-hand side here, you can just see the the level of growth in seaweed farming activity over the last 20 years. Uh, and it is, uh, is growing really significantly too because of those other industries that I was referencing before and, and those other industries wanting to move away from 
uh, from synthetics that they might be using for, uh, for stabilizing, for thickening, for bulking out. Uh, so uh, there is a, a huge amount of uh, growth in the seaweed farming industry uh, itself. We uh, at Notla, we have invested in some of that around uh, UK waters. Um, we actually source our seaweed from a number of different countries around the world. We do that, by the way, because uh, different seaweeds have different types of, uh, of active uh, ingredients, and those seaweed over time have evolved for different parts of the world, for different water temperatures, of course, um, and different depths of, uh, of ocean. So uh, we are sourcing our, our seaweed from, from a number of different countries around the world, and, and that will need to, um, to continue. Um, but uh, it is a really valuable, particularly seaweed uh, farming, has a really valuable part to play in supporting coastal communities. And a lot of the stuff, by the way, that we do in, in Europe with our, um, our sourcing of seaweed uh, in European waters, it is harvested by, uh, by, uh, by um, people who are, are also fishing as well. Um, so it provides a, another valuable uh, income stream for those people who are able to, um, to to smooth out the lumpiness that comes from their fishing in income. Looking at seaweed itself, uh, broadly it's organized into three families, red, brown, and, uh, and green. Uh, and there are around about 12,000 different species of seaweed that are currently mapped by science. Uh, what uh, what we do and, and you know what anyone else who uses seaweed of course is that the seaweed needs to be refined uh, around about 20 percent by weight of the seaweed gives the active ingredients the other 80 percent is essentially a fibrous uh, mass that is is left over it's a waste product uh, the best case scenario that might go for uh, to be spread onto farmland or potentially used as uh, as animal feed in a lot of cases, it is just dumped, uh, and so a core part of uh, of our aspiration as a uh, as a business is to be a regenerative business and to uh, actually put more back into the environment than that which we take out. Uh, so we are developing a number of products that take this fibrous um, this mass, uh, which is by the way that that you know as you can see here on the screen, it's where the color is. It's also where the smell is too, and and the flavor. So uh, this um, this extract. Uh, has none of the none of the flavors, none of the smells, etc. But our other materials that take the fiber, they they still smell of the ocean, uh, and so that's one of the nice things that goes with some of the materials that we're creating using that uh, that fiber is that they they directly through the senses they directly reference where they've come from. And here is a bit of an overview of uh, the types of materials that we are uh, developing as a uh, as a company. So. Uh, things like flexible films, uh, coatings to go onto uh, card and paper to give water and, uh, and grease resistance to those sorts of materials. Uh, the paper, which you can see on the left-hand side that has the Nopla uh, logo printed on it, that's one of the materials that takes the waste fiber. Uh, so that is a by, uh, by weight, it's 30% waste seaweed fiber. 60% uh, recycled, uh, post-consumer recycled, and 10% virgin. And we have a, uh, a team of paper engineers who are working on actually getting to a point of being able to make a paper from 100% uh, seaweed-based cellulose. Uh, the OHO, which is the edible bubble that uh, David was referencing right at the top of this call, that's over on the left-hand side again in the, in the orange there. This is something that holds... Any, anywhere between about 20 milliliters and about 100 milliliters approximately. Uh, and it's a bit like a, a cherry tomato uh, or, um, or a grape or something like that. Uh, so the idea is that it can encapsulate uh, beverages uh, and it's quite a fun experiential product. We uh, are probably most known for the work that we did with Lucasade at the London Marathon. So uh, runners were given these containing Lucozade rather than getting a, a bottle or a, uh, or a plastic lined cup um, to, uh, to hydrate. Uh, then we've also got our, uh, our pipette. So this on the bottom right hand side, which is designed for little single use uh, oil type applications, particularly for food service. Uh, and uh, the rigid, so that's on the right hand side, that uh, cup or bowl looking product. 
uh, it is again using that waste fiber that I was referencing before, and uh, we're exploring a whole range of different applications with uh, with this material. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the things that we're doing across all of uh, these areas as I go through the rest of the presentation uh, this afternoon. But really, right back to uh, to referencing this point around the EU single use plastic uh, directive. Uh, all of the things that we are doing is uh, is based on on natural chemistry and uh, and polymers and and a polymerization process which uh, replicates what is happening in uh, in nature and hence why we fall outside of the EU SUPD definition of uh, of a single use plastic. Uh, the thing that's really important to us, of course, is uh, in order for us to have an impact, uh, we need to be able to make our materials uh, scalable, uh, and so we've really set ourselves the challenge with, uh, with all of the products that we're developing to try and utilize existing uh, industrial processes as much as possible. Now, sometimes that means we might take a process from one industry and take it into another. So in the case of the, uh, the pipette, for example, it probably looks like a shape that uh, some of you may have seen before or inspired by a shape some of you might have seen before in the form of um, a, a supplement. Uh, so, you know, we took inspiration from the, uh, from the supplements industry in that particular case and have taken across to, uh, to packaging. So we really work quite hard with a number of different industrial partners uh, around the world uh, to understand the processes and to work with our materials such that they can integrate into those processes to uh, try and reduce the amount of, uh, you know, the, to the to reduce the amount of potential redundancy in, um, in existing uh, manufacturing, particularly when it comes to being able to uh, support with the greater um, scale up of our materials. And Part of that too, by the way, is also, and this I think comes also back a bit to uh, the point that I was making right at the top of um, of this presentation around uh, Nopla, the people at Nopla coming from very diverse backgrounds. What we really try to do is to challenge some of the conventions around what is seen as a benchmark in certain types of industries, uh, performance benchmarks. So, uh, here on the screen is just a side-by-side -side comparison. This is taking our coating on cardboard. That's uh, on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side is a PLA-coated box. And uh, what we can see here is, is actually our coating performing much better than the PLA-coated box when it comes to grease resistance. Uh, so we do a range of these, uh, these sorts of uh, tests. But when we go and speak to industry and we say, what sort of barrier properties do you need for a coating on a food service box? They'll tell us X, Y, and Z. Uh, and when we look at that and we, we do a practical test like the one that you see here on the screen, the reality is that what is, uh, is stated on the, the technical data sheet can sometimes be far, far higher than what is practically required for those sorts of applications. Uh, and to, to share a little, uh, a little anecdote when it comes to our flexible film and, and uh, the sachets that uh, you're all familiar with, I'm uh, of, of course, uh, in this particular case, it's a sachet to hold uh, an oil, uh, you know, an edible oil to go in a, um, a food box, um, you know, a meal kit that would be delivered to your house. Uh, and the company that we uh, are doing the work with, they gave us a whole range of uh, performance uh, criteria that we needed to meet around tear strength, uh, seal strength, et cetera, on the sachet. And we said, um, where did that come from? Well, you know, we, we can't do that particular seal strength at the moment, but we can do a seal strength that we think will, will suit the types of um, uh, of needs that you have and uh, ask, after asking why and, and you know it, it went through that company many many times trying to find out where the original uh, performance benchmark came from somebody who was there from the very early days said it actually came from us taking uh, a four pack of tin tomatoes and dropping it onto a sachet from a height of one meter and the sachet not bursting 
And that's how we set our, uh, our performance uh, criteria. Now, they say, actually, we don't even put a four pack of tin of tomatoes in our, uh, in our box anymore. We only put one, one tin. So if one tin can fall on the sachet and not burst, then we're happy. We're, uh, we're good to go. So uh, we see, of course, and, and for those uh, here who work in, uh, in packaging, particularly those who are familiar with, with plastic packaging, plastic packaging can do a remarkable job at many, many things, particularly when it comes to, uh, to barrier properties. Uh, but the big challenge, of course, is uh, what happens with those materials at end of life. So um, we're really working with, with organizations who are willing to challenge those conventions, who are willing to, uh, to say, actually, maybe we don't need what we originally thought we needed, particularly through uh, alternative business models as well. Uh, and uh, that is the way that we are able to, um, to get our materials into the market while we continue, of course, to, uh, to develop those materials in, uh, in the background to uh, further improve their barrier properties. Really, what uh, we do right back to this point about being inspired by nature, though, is that we actually give our materials to nature to see what happens to those uh, at end of life, you know, if they, if they were to find their way into uh, into the natural environment. And one of the ways in which we do that is by uh, putting the materials into a wormery. Uh, and it's a, a very um, rudimentary uh, box of, uh, of worms that we have in our office and we put time-lapse uh, photography on it and watch to see what happens. And on the right-hand side here, this is the OHO. So that bubble, the edible bubble that I showed before, you can see just how quickly the worms will eat it. And, and we do this, by the way, this test uh, as a further uh, proof point, if you like, of how nature will deal with our materials at end of life, if they were to find their way into, um, into the natural environment. Now, of course, there are a whole range of different certifications that we need to do for the relevant uh, uh, industries that we are working with. However, some of you may uh, may be aware of this. However, those uh, certifications, you know, there, there are a bunch of things that can be um, ignored, if you like, uh, through those certifications. So, so long as in the case of, say, a compostability certification, uh, potentially even up to 10% of the material can remain behind and uh, the certificate will, will still be granted. So uh, we think that in those particular cases where, you know, particularly where a consumer is seeing something like home compostable uh, as, a, as a really uh, virtuous aspect of a, a material, uh, when you go and stick that uh, material in a real life setting, like in somebody's compost bin in their back garden, you come back and you collect it, or you come back and you open the compost bin up a, a period of time later, and uh, some of you may well have seen this study that was done in the UK relatively recently around this, a lot of those compostable materials, so-called certified compostable materials, you come back and they're still there. Uh, they're not really breaking down. They break down in the controlled environments of a laboratory, but in the real world, they don't break down. And so that's why we use these sorts of things. So the wormery that's on the screen at the moment, uh, we're doing a similar sort of thing with uh, Seattle University uh, in a marine environment for our flexible films to really get a, a solid understanding of what happens if nature had to deal with these, you know, if these materials were to find their way into the natural environment, would they really break down? And uh, part of that too, of course, is uh, the work that we're doing around a life cycle assessment. And uh, there is a, a, I mean, you know, I, I referenced before our, um, our aspiration to be a, a regenerative business. Uh, it's also important to note here that we are a materials business. We are really in the, the business of developing the technology behind the materials. We're not a manufacturer. Uh, we then work with the industry to, uh, to manufacture and, and to scale up. So uh, what we, we do is that we run LCAs at various points throughout uh, the product's development, I guess. And, uh, and we try to be very transparent around where we are at at any one particular time. And, and these numbers that are on the screen here reference where we are at today with our materials. Uh, so in the case of say a coated box, particularly um, coated with PLA, the, uh, the carbon footprint 
is of our box is, is 12% less. Doesn't seem like necessarily a very large number, but it's also because uh, we don't have a lot of scale in the production that, uh, that we're doing at the moment. So uh, rather than make all sorts of claims around uh, huge benefits when it comes to things like CO2 equivalent, uh, we develop it based on where we are today, and then we'll continue to update that. And, and uh, we expect to continue to see improvements in that as, uh, as we scale as well. But it's important too to acknowledge that uh, there are some shortcomings uh, in the way in which LCAs are typically conducted by industry today. And uh, it's really encouraging to see uh, a number of businesses and, and also practitioners uh, taking on board and, and uh, adjusting their, their analysis to capture some of these limitation, limitations. Uh, I think particularly around uh, the impact of microplastics uh, in the environment, very, very difficult, of course, to, uh, to quantify, undeniable that they're there. Uh, very difficult, of course, to, to, because it's such a, a relatively new thing, very difficult to be able to quantify what the human toxicology issues are here. But uh, you know, LCAs can be used almost as a as a weapon by by some industries to focus exclusively on CO two, and of course, CO two reduction and, and mitigation is a very very important thing. But when it's used as a as a way of uh, drawing attention away from other things like microplastics uh, in the environment. Uh, we think that that uh, is a misleading thing for for organisations uh, to be doing, and you know, of course, um, access to the data around this is incredibly challenging uh, too. So, uh, again, just as a as a snapshot of the portfolio of materials that we are uh, developing, <coughs> excuse me, split here between that uh, twenty percent. Uh, that I referenced earlier on. And uh, you can see here across that top line how that goes into the various transparent, uh, flexible materials. Uh, and then the other 80%, which goes into the rigid protective packaging material and also the Nopla paper. So I'm just going to run through uh, some of the products in, in just a little bit more detail now to give you a bit more of a sense of, uh, of, of those products. So starting with the coating. This is the material that we have developed the furthest. This is the one that is uh, is now uh, available in a number of European markets. We are focusing on food service packaging initially, uh, right back to my point earlier around uh, things like matching barrier properties to uh, functional needs within industry. So in the case of food service packaging, Typically, the contents are only in the box for you know a few hours, maybe overnight. If you don't eat, eat all of your takeaway and you want to stick it in the in the fridge, uh, but what uh, is required of any fiber-based packaging that is to contain anything that has any form of moisture or any form of grease is a coating. Uh, and so, really, this is the bit that uh, uh, so many people, even within industry, don't really properly understand this layer of, of hidden plastic, uh, which might be polyethylene, it might be PLA, or uh, even more insidiously, it might even be PFAS uh, or, or one of the, the, um, the chemicals in the broader PFAS family, which are uh, increasingly being banned uh, around uh, the world. The, the US is taking a, a very strong stance on this, and I've spent quite a bit of time in the US recently uh, because we've got quite a lot of interest in uh, in our coating there and it, it uh, actually the, uh, the the challenge that a lot of food service packaging manufacturers are facing there is how do they get the PFAS out of the packaging not necessarily how do they get the plastic out of their uh, out of their packaging so you know there are different focus points in uh, in different markets around the world but this uh, invisible and I say invisible in, in inverted commas because uh, of course if you know what you're looking for you can see this um, but uh, consumers don't necessarily know about this and in our rush to as uh, particularly in consumer industries in our rush to move to fiber-based packaging because consumers have this perception that fiber-based packaging is better for the environment of course uh, we as a, as a packaging industry uh, are seeing an increased prevalence of, uh, of plastic lining there and, uh, and all the sorts of challenges that that then presents around 
things like fiber recovery and and the discharge of plastic into uh, into the environment, the, the the toxic sludge that is left over after fiber based uh, recycling processes, uh, and uh, from a uh, from a European perspective, there are around about two billion takeaway food containers that are used uh, each year. Uh, you know, I've spoken about PLA a bit already this afternoon. Uh, certainly, any of that packaging that is used by uh, more you know, mid-market to premium restaurant groups typically is a PLA lined. Uh, it requires industrial composting to, to properly break it down, which uh, that infrastructure is um, is really left wanting here in the UK and in a lot of European markets uh, as well. And then, of course, there's the, uh, the rise of aqueous or water-based or dispersion coatings, which really, that's a euphemistic term for a plastic coating. Uh, so it's really just referring to the way in which the coating is put onto the board. Uh, <clears throat> again, because of the uh, the effective weight of this coating relative to the weight of the, the board or the packaging itself, often being, uh, you know, with uh, with coat weights that might be uh, four grams, five grams, six grams uh, per square meter, uh, it almost instantly means that these things are going to pass uh, things like composting tests. And recycling industry, of course, uh, is uh, is quite happy with uh, these sorts of coatings because they get good fiber recovery. The microplastics come off the uh, off the surface quite readily through the recycling process. Uh, but these uh, aqueous or, or dispersion or water-based coatings typically are, are either the styrene-based or, or the acrylate-based. Uh, and what we know is uh, that styrene is a, is a possible carcinogen uh, and um, acrylates come from... Uh, uh, from fossil-based uh, sources, and uh, you know they they really they they will persist in the natural environment for a really really long period of time, and so it's quite uh, it's quite insidious. And and also I think there's you know we have things like the Competition and Markets Authority here, the CMA here in the UK, which has responsibility for uh, policing things like the Green Claims Code. Uh, we're seeing now uh, in the UK and, and um, in European markets uh, a bit more uh, effort that's being put into uh, the, the these organisations that are, um, are meant to be policing the the sorts of claims and and uh, also things like uh, the rise of activist uh, consumer groups too who are going after organisations who are making. Uh, misleading, whether that be uh, deliberately misleading or just simply because the, those organizations maybe are not well enough informed themselves, but who are making greenwashing or misleading uh, claims, it, it is, uh, it, it's not good for business uh, to not be well informed, particularly if you are in the packaging industry and uh, you have got these water-based or, or dispersion coatings in your portfolio and you're claiming them as plastic free. It's, it's, uh, it's not a good um commercial decision to be doing that because of the rise of uh, of all of this um, activist activity. So I've mentioned before in terms of where we are from an LCA perspective on, uh, on our boxes and uh, looking through where we compare ourselves. Uh, again, we've done a lot more work on the box because it is a material that is in the, uh, you know, is, is available commercially at scale now. Uh, looking through the various uh, aspects of LCA from global warming potential, acidification potential, where we really see um, one of the, uh, the, the significant benefits, of course, uh, around uh, uh, our material is in the fact that seaweed doesn't require land and uh, doesn't require things like fertilizer and fresh water, et cetera, to, to grow, unlike corn does, of course, for uh, for the production of uh, PLA. Moving on now to uh, our flexible film. This is in a much earlier stage of, uh, of development. Uh, so we have two flexible films that we're developing, one which is designed to dissolve in cold water, uh, one which is designed to, well, 
one which will dissolve in very hot water. Uh, instead, it's it's film that we are really uh, trying to create where solubility is not a desired attribute. Uh, so if, if you think about sealing films on pre-prepared meals, for example, or uh, the poly bag that your uh, online uh, piece of clothing that you bought gets shipped in, uh, or the sachet of the sample cosmetics that you might get from a cosmetics company, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the... Uh, looking at the uh, the cold water soluble film, that that's the one that is a bit more uh, progressed rather than what we call our general purpose film or the one that dissolves in very hot water. Uh, it's interesting here too. Uh, I I wonder how many people on the the call are um, close to the EU SUPD uh, and all the elements. We have a, a material, by the way, that's in our cold water soluble film that that doesn't pass the single use plastic directive. Um, it's interesting though that. Uh, the reason it doesn't pass is because uh, in a packaging setting, it's classified as being uh, not suitable because there's a, an element of chemical modification, but it's actually a food ingredient. It's actually in a number of foods that we uh, that we eat. So, um, you know, we we see that of course there's a, a bunch of challenges around how the SUPD has uh, is uh, is being written, and you know, it's still very early days, of course, uh, with that. But we are um, we're actually working on trying to get that. We're, we're taking the assumption that uh, that particular ingredient in a packaging setting is always going to be uh, for foul of the SUPD. So we're looking at ways of replacing it. And here's a just a few little examples of uh, of how we take. Uh, we can take this, what we call the cold water soluble film. Uh, essentially, it's a PVOH replacement. Uh, and, you know, so things like you might be familiar with uh, tablets and, and pods, et cetera, that you stick into your, your washing machine or your dishwasher, et cetera. Uh, really, we're trying to, uh, to replace that material. And, and that's because there are more and more questions that are being raised around PVOH. Certainly, it's fossil based, so, so there's no challenge around that. But questions being raised around what is actually happening to this material when it solubilizes and goes down our drains and into the natural environment. Here's the pipette uh, that uh, I referenced earlier on that uh, holds olive oil, uh, other edible oils, uh, facial oils, you know, cosmetic oils, et cetera, really, again, for, for single dose. Um, inspired by uh, the pharma and, and uh, supplements industries here in uh, in this particular product, so it is edible, you know, like uh, like our other materials. Uh, we don't classify our pipette as a food because you know people are going to be touching it, and uh, we can laser etch and print etc. on it. Uh, but you could actually eat this, and, and it's one of the things that we do uh, a bit around the office for uh, for fun, of course when we have uh, prospective customers coming in is, is uh, open it, pour the olive oil out and then eat the packaging afterwards. I was referencing earlier on too, the, the use of the fiber. Uh, so here is taking that, uh, that material, that, that, that waste material and uh, doing things both through compression molding and increasingly through injection molding. So we started with compression because it was a bit of an easier process now well advanced on injection molding development. Uh, and of course, injection molding being the one that's more at, uh, more at scale, but uh, all sorts of different potential applications in uh, consumer oriented uh, packaging, you know, even all the way through to cutlery. Uh, we're playing around with golf tees at the moment. So uh, really what we do is, is we take this, uh, this material and uh, we're trying to take it in lots of different directions, just really to understand the processability uh, but all framed through looking at where there are uh, issues around single use and how we can replace those, uh, those single use pieces of packaging with a material that in this particular case, you can, if you put water on it, uh, and this is really one of the enemies of our materials in, in many, many settings. And one of the big challenges that we face, of course, uh, but if you put water on it, it will start to break down. Uh, and in fact, the fish will even uh, will come and eat this material. So what we do is uh, we actually have what we call our innovation lab. And, and this is where we bring together engineers, uh, designers, chemists, and we work with uh, consumer brands where we take on a, a challenge and we, uh, we explore the ways in which our materials could potentially solve uh, that particular problem. And just to, to finish up with two examples of uh, products that are either in the market now or, or shortly coming to market that started with this original philosophy. So the first is the work that we do with Just Eat on coated packaging that goes uh, across now 10 European markets. And we do quite a lot of stuff in 
uh, in sporting events, particularly through football with them, where if anyone here has uh, been to um, any of the UEFA Champions League uh, major events or uh, the Women's Euros finals at Wembley last year. Uh, so this started actually originally out of a challenge set to us by Just Eat uh, around replacing the plastic uh, takeaway food container. Uh, that was several years ago, and here we are now with a, a product that is being sold across many European markets, and so we're really um, proud for us to see the way in which that material has developed over time. And the second is uh, to replace the, the sachet. Uh, any cyclists or any runners or, uh, or, you know, or endurance athletes who are on the call here will be familiar with this multi-laminate uh, uh, gel sachet. Uh, which is impossible to recycle, uh, but a really necessary thing, of course, if you're doing uh, doing endurance events. So working with a um, uh, a global sports retailer here, where we have created a, a replacement for that particular material, and it's going to be tested in a range of um, sporting events uh, a bit later on this year. So that uh, that brings me to the end of uh, of the presentation. I'm going to stop sharing now, and uh, I think we've got a few questions that have come in. So what I'll do is I'll hand back over to uh, to David again. Thank you very much, Tristan. You want to turn your camera on so that they can all see how wonderful you are. Here they go. All right. Yes, thanks for that brilliant presentation. Um, I have to say that the thing that, that astounded me last time and astounds me again is the 2 billion food boxes in Europe. It's just the scale of packaging is just unbelievable. So uh, presumably that's the, that's duplicated in America and the Far East and China and places like that. That's right. And in fact, in the US, uh, you don't simply multiply that by, uh, you know, a bigger population because the US is an even bigger consumer of disposable packaging. Um, some here might even know this at uh, it's around about, uh, I think it's around about 250, 260 kilograms of plastic waste per American consumer per annum, which is twice the European consumer. Uh, amazing. Anyway, uh, your comeuppance is now because you have chemists in the audience. So the first question <laughs> is, <laughs> what is best. the material you're talking about? What, what, what is what, the so, so what, what, what you, you, you talked about the extract. Um, yes, uh, and you talked about the fibers and things like that. So, what what are the chemicals involved in here? It's essentially various forms of hydrocolloids. So, you know, alginates, carrageenans, etc. This is this is essentially what the the kind of raw um, raw extract is, uh, and uh, then various salts uh, as well for cross linking purposes. So, so to, to go back to the thing about the difference between plants and, and seaweed. Um, and, and, and congratulations for, for, for pointing out that oil actually comes from marine algae in the first place, which is, of course, what, what's interesting about all the work that's going on in alginates in the, in the Middle East at the moment. Um, the, 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 the basic point, as I remember it, is that they are, they're, they're made out of similar polysaccharides. You know, plants are made out of uh, cellulosics and, 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 and starches and things like that, which are just basically polysaccharides at different levels of branching. And the same building block, the, 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 the saccharide building blocks that they're used in, in thing. And as you say, you end up with the alginates in particular, which are really nice because they're semi-soluble, as you say. I mean, it's so the, the one thing I vaguely remember for my definition of algae is that they're missing lignin, which is the thing that which is gives wood structure and rigidity because you don't need that in the sea because it would work. So actually, there's more, there's more useful material in seaweed than there is in a lot of uh, land-based uh, sources of, of polysaccharides, which is quite interesting in its own right, isn't it? That, that's right. And it's also one of the reasons why we're so excited about the potential for paper um, because of uh, the cellulose that you can extract from the seaweed and, and the lack of, uh, of lignin that you described, which you know, it's very difficult to get lignin out of, uh, yeah. out of, of, of wood you know, to, to make paper. Uh, energy intensive, chemically intensive. So another reason why we're really excited about the prospect in paper for, uh, for that very reason. So, so interesting, the same chem chemist, obviously, in the audience has asked, uh, yeah, you mentioned chem chemical modifications. Uh, are there any done to the, the materials or, or are they, they 
I, th I think under the, 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 the European legislation, you have to not chemically modify them, don't you? That's right. You have to not chemically modify them. It doesn't mean, by the way, that you can't do any form of uh, polymerization, but that has to represent what happens in nature. So um, you, you can't do anything. And th this is why, by the way, that PHA is, at least under the definition of, of the EU SUPD, this is why PHA uh, is defined as a single-use plastic because that fermentation process doesn't happen in, uh, in nature. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so um, the the coating on the paper is that a post paper manufactured coating, or do you put it into the the uh, the the paper process itself, and it's you know migrates to the surface? It's it, so it's post. Okay. Uh, so so at the moment it uh, it is post. What we um, have done some work in the past of exploring is particularly with molded fiber. Um, so, and that's often where you see PFAS giving the, the water the grease resistance and PFAS is then added into the slurry. And so it's, uh, it's through the forming um, is exploring our coating added into that slurry to form molded fiber, very, very expensive way for us to, um, uh, to, to go. So we're looking then, and it's interesting that industry is starting to move this way anyway, of again, still applying the coating post forming. But in the case of folding uh, box board, carton board, it is a post paper uh, making process that we apply the coating. Okay. Uh, so, so it's another question is, 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 are there, I mean, you, you mentioned the, the, the color, you know, you, you classify your, your, your seaweeds by color and, and there's the, you talked about the odor as well. Is there any problem with color bleeding through into things or is, where, do the, where does the colour come from and, and is it taken out in your processing, I guess, is the question. Yeah, it is taken out. Um, so the various uh, colouring compounds um, adhere to the, the fibres. So um, the actual powder that, uh, that we use that is refined out of all of the seaweeds, is, is, it is almost colourless. I guess it has a sort of a slight yellow tinge to it. Um, but, uh, yeah, the... Um, the, the compounds that give it the brown, the green, the red, the, they are refined out. So colour, flavour, aroma, don't find their way into the flexible materials, but they remain in the um, uh, in things like the paper, but the colour oxidises and that's why it goes black. You know, it oxidises quite quickly. Okay. So the, 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 we've, got, we've got another question here from, from uh, uh, someone. It's basically what's the biggest industrial challenge to scaling this up? I mean, you know, you obviously you you've made the point that there is a need for these kinds of materials at scale, and you know, you know, even a thin layer coating two billion cardboard takeaway boxes is going to take a fair amount of material. Uh, you've talked about the potential resource, and you know, you know, I've heard arguments about. Uh, Collecting seaweed is usually done on coastlines, but actually there's a lot, as you said, of, of, of microalgae and seaweeds growing in the wide ocean as well. Uh, so, so you know, there will be a, a harvesting issue there as well. But I mean, so what's stopping you from taking over the world and, and, and scaling this up to be the packaging material of choice? Hmm. The answer depends a bit on the material itself. Um, in the case of the coating, nothing is stopping us from, from taking over the world. Uh, except cost, uh, you know, and, and we are really trying to, um, through scale, because it is a commoditized industry, get our costs down so that price is not a disincentive for people to move across. Um, we're, by the way, just to give people a sense of scale, we're, we're probably at around about a, depends on where you look, you know, maybe, maybe a 20 to 30, 40% premium, like for like, to a PLA uh, lined food service takeaway box. Um, when you break that down into pence, you know, we are talking pennies. So, so you know, we're, we're pretty well there. Um, and uh, what we've managed to do over, really over the last six months is get from a point where we were able to put the coating on our cardboard, our cardboard. It's not our, we don't make the cardboard. We source the cardboard on the open market, but we're very selective about who we work with. Um, getting from a point where we're able to put the coating on at around about 10 metres a minute, um, we're at a point now where we're around about 150 meters a minute and we're doing some work that's sort of more focused around 400 meters a minute. Uh, and a paper mill 
is typically producing paper at around about a thousand meters a minute. Uh, so that gives you a, a sort of broad sense of we've come quite a long way. There's still a way to go, um, but uh, really it's, it's only cost that's preventing things on the, the coating and that will come down as we scale. On things like the flexible films, um, barrier properties typically are, are much more demanding from industry on flexibles than they are on coatings. Um, and uh, the, the manufacturing process is, is, is arguably more, more demanding, you know, going through vertical form filling sachet machines and so on. There's lots of heat, there's lots of tension, there's lots of friction. Um, and these machines have been, have been developed uh, over decades. Uh, and we're, you know, we're at the beginning of the journey. So uh, I think it, uh, yeah, the answer varies a little bit depending upon the materials, but, but certainly from a coatings point of view, there's, there's pretty well nothing from, and, and we're scaling up quite rapidly now. And it, it, I mean, both the, the earth shot and uh, the, the venture capital market seems to agree you have potential as I, yes. as I see it as well. Yeah. So well done now. So a uh, couple of more questions. Couple more questions. Um, uh, good, good one here about what's the lifetime of your films when they're used in the pipettes and the ohos and things like that. I mean, how long can they last before you know something happens to them and they lose integrity? I mean, yeah, yeah, um, good, good question. So, um, in the case of oho, by the way, that's a um, uh, it, it's the oho starts its life as a dough, um, so it's a wet process. Uh, depends a bit on the content. Uh, it could be anywhere from, you know, if you took an OHO and you left it on your kitchen bench, you know, much like a, a blueberry, it will start to dehydrate, you know, pretty quickly. Okay. Uh, come back a week later and it's, it's pretty well shriveled. Um, in the case of, uh, I don't know, if you kept it in a sealed container and you kept it in a chilled environment, it'll last several weeks. Um, that's the OHO, but the OHO, that's the edible bubble. That's really the product that we use for, for activation and, um, and experiential applications. Flexible film, again, it depends on the content. So uh, in the case of oils, we have a very good oxygen barrier property with our flexible film. In the case of oils, uh, we, we are potentially looking at, you know, maybe a year or so that we might be able to keep a, um, an oil inside without it um, degrading. Um, and pretty similar with a pipette. Uh, however, when we bring anything that's water-based to it, and, and when I say water-based, I mean anything probably more than about 10% as, as a rough guide, anything more than about 10% water content, we see that the material starts to, um, to break down quite quickly. I'm just, just thinking through the, the logic of, of having an OHO with a cocktail and it turning into a sort of cocktail raisin at the end of a week on the thing. So anyway, <laughs> um, fi final question, uh, Tristan. A lot of people have been asking, uh, you know, being really interested in this and asking whether you mind us sharing your email with them. Uh, of course, very happy to have that. Uh, so so we'll, we'll, we'll put it in the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the chat later. Can they see the chat? I can't remember. We'll, we'll find a way if, if, if you need it. Uh, talk to one of us because our emails are on thing. So, so thank you. If uh, go back to the the slides, sorry, please. Right. Next one. So, next slide. See, we do it all the time and we still get you get it wrong. <laughs> You've got, uh, got no more events this year, obviously. No, no, we have, yes. That's what <laughs> I want to talk about. <laughs> so, I mean, one, one if, you're, if you're not a member of the SCI, why not? Come on. Um, we're going to change gears uh, for the final three meetings uh, later in the year and talk about uh, equality, diversity and inclusion. Uh, so uh, they are very, uh, very interesting talks i mean honestly the quality of the speakers we've got is, is 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 considering what a complicated subject it is is really good so on on the end of september we're doing women in sem uh we're talking uh, more about the, the more general edi issues uh, in october and we're then we're talking about uh various uh gender issues and association and identity stuff in November. So uh, really, really look out for these if, if these are big issues in modern society and such. Um, but uh, if I could just one last time, 
Uh, thank Tristan for an excellent talk. And just tell everybody how sad it is that we're not in the meeting. We can't all go and have some ohos now because they are truly amazing. Uh, but but thank you very much, Tristan. And uh, I hope to see you around in on the circuit soon anyway. OK, take care. Bye bye.